Good evening. Good evening. Let's begin the meeting this, this evening, singing hymn number 341. They who seek the throne of grace find that throne in every place. If we live a life of prayer, God is present everywhere. Hymn 341. begin with the Bible. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version and in the book of Genesis. Now Israel loved Joseph. I'm sorry, I should announce first that the theme of the readings tonight is being in our right place. Now, from Genesis. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children because he was the son of his old age. And he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his bro brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Once Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream that I dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Suddenly, my sheaf rose and stood upright. Then your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us? So they hated him even more because of his dreams and his words. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. 
throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Then they took Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They had, they had the long robe with sleeves taken to their father, and they said, This we have found. See now whether it is your son's robe or not. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. A wild animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. Now Joseph was taken down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. He was in the house of his Egyptian master. From the time that he made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all he had, in house and in field. When his master heard the words of that his wife spoke to him, saying, This is the way your servant treated me, he became enraged, and Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. He remained there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. He gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's care all the prisoners who were in the prison and whatsoever was done there. He was the one who did it. After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed. In the morning his spirit was troubled. So he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was hurriedly brought out of the dungeon. When he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, It is not I. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. After them, there will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land. The plenty will no longer be known in the land because of the famine that will follow, for it will be very grievous. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land, and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plenteous years. Let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming to lay up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities, and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to befall the land of Egypt, so that the land may not perish through the famine. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only with regard to the throne, 
will I be greater than you. And the seven years of famine began to come, just as Joseph had said. There was famine in every country, but throughout the land of Egypt, there was bread. So ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. Now Joseph was governor over all the land. It was he who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. Although Joseph had recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Psalms. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. From the Gospels of Luke and Matthew. After eight days had passed, it was time to circumcise the child, and he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. And when he was twelve years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended, they started to return. The boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. 2 Corinthians Thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads in every place the fragrance that comes from knowing Him. I'll now read correlative passages from the Christian Science textbook, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures by Mary Baker Eddy. Where the Spirit of God is, and there is no place where God is not, evil becomes nothing, the opposite of the something of spirit. Genesis chapter 1, verse 5. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. All questions as to the divine creation being both spiritual and material, are answered in this passage. For though solar beams are not yet included in the record of creation, still there is light. This light is not from the sun, nor from volcanic flames, but it is the revelation of truth and of spiritual ideas. This also shows that there is no place where God's light is not seen, since truth, life, and love fill immensity and are ever-present. If you are too material to love the science of mind and are satisfied with good words 
instead of effects. If you adhere to error and are afraid to trust truth, the question then recurs, Adam, where art thou? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you have more faith in drugs than in truth, this faith will incline you to the side of matter and error. The act of healing the sick through divine mind alone, of casting out error with truth, shows your position as a Christian scientist. The demands of God appeal to thought only, but the claims of mortality and what are termed laws of nature appertain to matter. Which then are we to accept as legitimate and capable of producing the highest human good? We cannot obey both physiology and spirit, for one absolutely destroys the other, and one or the other must be supreme in the affections. It is impossible to work from two standpoints. If we attempt it, we shall presently hold to the one and despise the other. Befogged in error, the error of believing that matter can be intelligent for good or evil, we catch clear glimpses of God only as the mists disperse or as they melt into such thinness that we perceive the divine image in some word or deed which indicates the true idea. The supremacy and reality of good, the nothingness and unreality of evil. When we realize that there is one mind the divine law of loving our neighbor as ourselves is unfolded, whereas a belief in many ruling minds hinders man's normal drift towards the one mind, one God, and leads human thought into opposite channels where selfishness reigns. When we fully understand our relation to the divine, we can have no other mind but his, no other love, wisdom, or truth no other sense of life, and no consciousness of the existence of matter or error. The substance of all devotion is the reflection and demonstration of divine love, healing sickness, and destroying sin. Our Master said, If ye love me, keep my commandments. One's aim, a point beyond faith, should be to find the footsteps of truth, the way to health and holiness. We should strive to reach the horrid height where God is revealed, and the cornerstone of all spiritual building is purity. The baptism of spirit, washing the body of all the impurities of flesh, signifies that the pure in heart see God and are approaching spiritual life and its demonstration. As mortals give up the delusion that there is more than one mind, more than one God, man in God's likeness will appear. And this eternal man will include in that likeness no material element. As a material, theoretical life basis is found to be a misapprehension of existence, the spiritual and divine principle of man dawns upon human thought and leads it to where the young child was, even to the birth of a new old idea, to the spiritual sense of being and of what life includes. Thus the whole earth will be transformed by truth on its pinions of light, chasing away the darkness of error. The human thought must free itself from self-imposed materiality and bondage. It should no longer ask of the head, heart, or lungs, what are man's prospects for life? Mind is not helpless. Intelligence is not mute before non-intelligence. Divine science does not put new wine into old bottles, soul into matter, nor the infinite into the finite. Our false views of matter perish as we grasp the facts of spirit. The old belief must be cast out or the new idea will be spilled and the inspiration 
which is to change our standpoint, will be lost. Now, as of old, truth casts out evils and heals the sick. The real life, or mind, and its opposite, the so-called material life and mind, are figured by two geometrical symbols, a circle, or sphere, and a straight line. The circle represents the infinite, without beginning or end. The straight line represents the finite, which has both beginning and end. The sphere represents good, the self-existent and eternal individuality or mind. The straight line represents evil, a belief in a self-made and temporary material existence. Eternal mind and temporary material existence never unite in figure or in fact. A straight line finds no abiding place in a curve, and a curve finds no adjustment to a straight line. Similarly, matter has no place in spirit, and spirit has no place in matter. Truth has no home in error, and error has no foothold in truth. A Christian scientist occupies the place at this period of which Jesus spoke to his disciples when he said, Ye are the salt of the earth. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on an hill cannot be hid. Let us watch, work, and pray that this salt lose not its saltness, and that this light be not hid, but radiate and glow into noontide glory. Sorrow has its reward. It never leaves us where it found us. The furnace separates the gold from the dross that the precious metal may be graven with the image of God. The cup our Father hath given, shall we not drink it and learn the lessons he teaches? When the ocean is stirred by a storm, then the clouds lower, the wind shrieks through the titan shrouds, and the waves lift themselves into mountains. We ask the helmsman, do you know your course? Can you steer safely amid the storm? He answers bravely, but even the dauntless seaman is not sure of his safety. Nautical science is not equal to the science of mind. Yet, acting up to his highest understanding, firm at the post of duty, the mariner works on and awaits the issue. Thus should we deport ourselves on the seething ocean of sorrow, hoping and working one should stick to the wreck until an irresistible propulsion precipitates his doom or sunshine gladdens the troubled sea. Question. What is mind? Answer. Mind is God. The exterminator of error is the great truth that God, good, is the only mind, and that the supposititious opposite of infinite mind, called devil or evil, is not mind, is not truth, but error without intelligence or reality. There can be but one mind because there is but one God. And if mortals claim no other mind and accepted no other, Sin would be unknown. We can have but one mind if that one is infinite. We bury the sense of infinitude when we admit that, although God is infinite, evil has a place in this infinity. For evil can have no place where all space is filled with God. We lose the high signification of omnipotence when, after admitting that God, or good, is omnipresent and has all power, we still believe there is another power, named evil. This belief, that there is more than one mind, is as pernicious to divine theology as our ancient mythology and pagan idolatry. With one Father, even God, the whole family of man would be brethren. And with one mind and that God or good, the brotherhood of man would consist of love and truth. 
and have unity of principle and spiritual power which constitute divine science. In Colossians chapter 3 verse 4, Paul writes, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, be manifested, then shall ye also appear, be manifested, with him in glory. When spiritual being is understood in all its perfection, continuity, and might, then shall man be found in God's image. The absolute meaning of the apostolic words is this. Then shall man be found in his likeness, perfect as the Father, indestructible in life, hid with Christ in God, with truth in divine love, where human sense hath not seen man. Please join now in a few moments of silent prayer and then pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Our second hymn this evening is number 227. O Lord, where'er thy people meet, there they behold thy mercy seat. Where, where'er they seek thee, thou art found and every place is hallowed ground. Hymn 227.
The members of this church extend a warm welcome to those who are visiting us this evening, either in person or by Zoom. If you'd like more information about Christian Science, please ask the usher for assistance. If you are joining us by Zoom or viewing a YouTube recording, send us an email. Our address is at our website. Type Third Church Miami in your internet browser. This church is a branch of the Mother Church, the First Church of Christ Scientist in Boston, Massachusetts. The Bible lesson sermon read here and in Christian Science churches throughout the world on Sunday morning helps individuals to meet their needs with divine truth. Our Sunday service and Sunday school both begin at 10 a.m. In our reading room, a quiet sanctuary in this building, you may study, borrow, or purchase the Bible, the Christian Science Textbook, the Christian Science Monitor, an international weekly news magazine, and other Christian Science literature. But every member of our church has a key to the reading room, and we'll be happy to open it for you anytime convenient for you. Everyone is invited to attend our services, use the reading room, and bring children to Sunday school. You're also welcome to visit our website and our YouTube recordings. Just look for Third Church Miami. This meeting is now open to you to share testimonies of healing and remarks on Christian science. If you are joining us by Zoom, please don't forget to unmute yourself so we can hear what you have to say. And thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you to Dan and Eli for bringing us our music. And as always, thank you to Joster and Joe for letting our light shine out in the world. Let's close the meeting now singing hymn number 135. I know no life divided, O Lord of life from thee. In thee is life provided for all mankind and me. I know no death, O Father, because I live in thee. Thy life it is that frees us from death eternally in 135. 